Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our CHEP webinar tonight. My name is uh, Nathan Brown. I'm Associate Faculty at University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm the Vice Chair of CHEP. Um, in case you aren't familiar with CHEP or that familiar with it, we are the Consortium for the Humanities, Ethics, and Professionalism housed within CHEP, uh, within ACAPT. As a consortium, we strive to balance the pillars of evidence-based practice by advocating for the humanities, ethics, and professionalism in physical therapy education. Uh, if you haven't been to, to, to it yet, please explore our website. Uh, we're gonna have the link posted in the chat in a moment. We have resources for educators in our repository, which you can also add to, and updates regarding the activity of our leadership and members and notices about events like tonight. We have regular meetings of Education Leadership Conference, like the other consortia do, but we also plan to continue to offer webinars like this one tonight. Um, a couple times a year, we'll have these, uh, so please keep a lookout for our next one. During the talk tonight, please feel free to post questions in the chat. Cindy Dodds, who's the chair of our consortium, will be collecting questions to pose to our speaker during a, a few different planned breaks. I'm so excited to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, although to most of you, she would need no introduction. Uh, Dr. Laura uh, Dolly Swisher. Uh, she's a professor emeritus and former director of the School of Physical Therapy and Rehabilit Rehabilitation Sciences at University of South Florida and in, uh, in the USF Health Monsani College of Medicine. She is the author of publications on professionalism, ethics, and interprofessional education and has presented at numerous state, national, and inter, uh, international meetings. Dr. Swisher served as a member and chair of the Commission on Accreditation for Physical Therapy Education, as former chair of the APTA Ethics and Judicial Committee, and served as co-chair of the task force to revise the core ethics documents. Dr. Swisher serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Physical Therapy Education, and was a founding member of the editorial board of Jour Journal of Humanities and Re Rehabilitation. She is the recipient of APTA's Lucy Blair Service Award, the Pauline Sarasoli Lecture Award, and the Catherine Worthingham Fellow of the APTA. At this time, join me in welcoming Dr. Swisher, and I will let you take it from here. Thank you all for coming. Well, thanks so much, Nathan, for that introduction. And uh, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, what we're going to do tonight. Uh, so originally, I was asked to kind of talk about to expand, ex expand on the Poly Sarasoli lecture in that we were talking about professionalism. And I'm hoping that what will generate is a lot of discussion about professionalism, which really the Sarasoli lecture didn't really uh, permit for that. And uh, so in, in that way, even though this was advertised uh, as the same title as the Poly Sarasoli lecture, the title really is Educating for Professional Identity, Setting a New Course. And the primary question that I'd like for us to think about is, uh, what role should the humanities have as, as we go forward in physical therapy education? So I set these, you know, it's always always be a mistake to not have objectives for an educational presentation. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk about the history of professionalism education, that we can talk about the importance of professional identity formation, recognizing that it's a post-professional world, or debate that it is it a post-professional world. You may not think that. And uh, we could talk about the significance of that. And uh, to discuss the role of humanities and pro promoting professional identity formation as well as professional behaviors. And to think a little bit about the challenges of defining and evaluating outcomes of humanities content. So I wish, should say um, I, I'm honored that so many people are signing on. I had thought we might be a smaller group. At the same time, if you have a burning question and you want to interject that, because one of the goals is to get some discussion going, I hope that you will go ahead and raise your hand. There's a format for that with the bar at the top of the page that you would be able, and uh, that's being monitored. So feel free to interject with questions and um, also show your video when you're having, I think they automatically that'll be done for you. So this is a follow-up. And primarily we wanna talk about major points of the lecture and how that might influence humanities education. And uh, as I've said, I hope that it'll be highly interactive. So um, one of the things that I wanna start with that wasn't a part of the lecture, but is to just to talk a little bit about humanities. 
and to think a little bit about terminology. It's been a real honor to be involved in CHEP because uh, it is one of the few organizations within the APTA and the educational community that carries forward a concern about humanities and also about ethics. And I do wanna applaud the work of the group. There's an awful lot of good work going on within, uh, within that consortium and also Sarah Blanton, under Sander, Sarah Blanton's leadership in terms of the journal. So there are a lot of resources there. But even though we all talk about humanities, we may not all be speaking the same language. And I will say as someone who was in the College of Medicine, that there's a tendency for people to be committed to medical humanities and I myself found that problematic. We had a blended curriculum with medicine and physical therapy in the first year. And the people that taught it were very committed to the idea of medical humanities. So the idea of health humanities is a little bit, uh, a little bit more recent. And I thought that this, uh, that this um, quote that talks about the health versus humanities and talk about the linguistic, linguistic shift to health humanities uh, it acknowledges an important idea that illness and, and phenomenon are more than just medical diagnos diagnosis related and talking about the broader lived experience of people. Um, and so uh, within that article that I've cited there by Barry, they talk a little bit about the role that uh, health disparities, the disability information and also the information about um, cultural differences are captured more in some of the health information. But we should be aware that we don't necessarily all agree about what the humanities are. Let's see. And um, one of the things in the polysericole that I talked quite a bit about was the kind of dichotomy. So um, I just, the, uh, the slogan, the science of healing, the art of caring, uh, is something that really has resonated with me as a physical therapist, because I do think the physical therapy brings together an art and a science. But I also think that behind this, say, around this slogan may be a kind of dichotomy that may not be totally, totally, totally acceptable to us. And that is the idea that we're pitting hard science or evidence against soft, caring art. And I just wanted to say that both healing and, and caring have a science and an art. And I think that this rigid divide that we sometimes have between healing and caring and science and art is reflected in our curriculum as we tend to think about um, professionalism as kind of a soft area and more associated with the artistic. And I want people to acknowledge that professionalism actually does have a basis and has an evidentiary basis and there is something of a science to it in terms of evaluating and those sorts of things. So we don't have a whole lot of time to elaborate on that, but there is a kind of an epistemology that's implied in that dichotomy that we might not really want to totally buy. And just as there is an art and a science to mobilization, that's the, the same thing can be said about professionalism. So another key point that we want to think about in terms of contextualizing professionalism is that the, over, the overall environment of thinking about professionalism, and that is that our thinking has changed dramatically. Of course, we're 100 years old and our journey coincides somewhat with the journey that thinking about being a profession is. So if we think on the collective level first, we can think about um, what does it mean to be a profession? And that's kind of, that's graduated through de several different periods. The first period was earlier in the, in the 20th century, really, where they said, well, professions are, are disciplines, are whatever, you, you know, disciplines and groups that are occupational groups that have certain qualities. And we could kind of spin out all of what those are. They're people that have, an, it's an ideal type kind of based on the sociology literature. And they are groups that have a, um, have a body of knowledge. They have a degree of autonomy. They have, a per, they have an orientation towards service. And we all probably have had these and taught many of you are teaching those. What are the traits that true professions have? And as you'll remember, Flexner was, Flexner was really one of the um, medical, medical scholars that kind of said, well, there are true professions, typically 
typically delineated by a degree of autonomy and a true unique body of knowledge. And there are paraprofessionals. Of course, at the time, he was as interested in categorizing what were not professions as were. So uh, from that perspective, you would look and say, is physical therapy a per for true profession. And I think we thought maybe that we didn't maybe have the autonomy that we desired. But people started to recognize the limitations to that kind of approach to what is a profession. And the next, the next period in um, sociology, particularly, and in some of the other disciplines to look at what is a profession, talked about occupational groups that were able to gain professional status, which was a social process where um, the group was, got recognition and we were, you know, and Nancy Kirsch was just on a minute ago having just given a presentation. So this is this, this process where a group is recognized by the state and as, and by society as gaining enough control over what they're doing and carving out their own scope of practice and gain, gaining a degree of autonomy in that way as a social process. So that kind of also picked up traits as well a little bit, but this, this idea of what it meant to be a profession kind of dominated really more in the 1950s and 70s. But at the same time as this was going on, there was growing appreciation that the professions don't always live up to their responsibility and that profession, professions become groups that exclude people of diversity. They, dis, they may discriminate, they, rec, they um, serve sort of as a closed union as you might frame it, and that the professions weren't living up to either the ideal traits or the or uh, and this process of professionalization wasn't necessarily resulting in, in groups that were really serving the interests of society. And in fact, they mostly may have uh, existed as a kind of a trade union to uh, limit to limit other people's uh, infringing upon their turf. So this post-professional phase in this recognizes that professions are not necessarily living up to what they should be doing in terms of society. In that way, they're not necessarily exclusively, uh, <clears throat> they're not recognized as um, with the status that they would. Now, some people have called this the death of professions. And if you go, and if you look in the sociology literature, it basically kind of stops, which is kind of curious because up until that time, there had been a whole line of scholarship and sociology literature that was interested in how do we decide what is a profession, what are the traits of this profession and those sorts of things. So the take home message about that, uh, this, to this current post-professional reframing, which I prefer to think of this as the post-professional reframing, as opposed to calling it as the death of professions, recognizes, recognizes that professions and physical therapy with them, whether you think we have totally enough autonomy or not, that, they, um, that they're historically situated, they're always products of their time, and that um, you have to recognize that there's been a little bit of a loss of status because we, probably should accept the critique of professions as being very Western in their orientation. By the way, this is one of the things that happened in this the literature was that there was recognition that the insights that came from Western scholars didn't necessarily translate to uh, Europe, Asia, and a variety of other cultures and what they thought about what it means to be a profession. So um, the critique, you know, promoting race, class, and gender inequities, being monopolistic in supporting closure of the field, uh, the discrimination, bias, and exclusion of diversity, and perhaps the professions maybe were self-interested versus having a surface uh, orientation that we had hoped they would. Overall, there was also some kind of, this represents a kind of deprofessionalization at the same time. So here we're talking about the collective notion of professions. And uh, those of you that listened to the Sarah Soli knew I was using this idea of the bicycle and the balloon. I am not revisiting that. Uh, it was kind of um, Johnson's idea that, you know, uh, we need people that are floating in the balloon and people more on the bicycle. So I still pose the question, so that's in case you're wondering why the bicycle and the balloon. Uh, what does it mean for professions and individual professions? I think that this progression of what we've thought about what it means to be a profession 
the take home message is it, we can't assume that uh, a profession necessarily has positive traits or social functions. And we have to reframe our identity constantly within the historical context that we are in and address negative issues of power monopoly, conflict of interest, bias, closure, and lack of diversity. And at the same time, we're continuously, collectively and individually in the process of earning the trust of patients and the public through our own actions. And if we don't do that, we risk the social process of being deprofessionalized as a profession, either collectively or individually. So at this point, I'd like to pause just a second, uh, pause a minute or two to see if there are any questions uh, about that part, because I was trying to frame where we are in terms of looking at professions more generally. Are there questions that people want to pose in chat or um, verbally? So Dolly, we do have a post from um, Philip Davis that states okay. knowledge, knowledge itself is power. And he also provided the Latin version. Okay. Is that, a, that's a question or I, I do think knowledge can be power. Was that a question? Is knowledge power? No, well, so I, I can add to that. I actually use this quote in my lecture today. I'm a physician assistant. I've worked closely with physical therapy, uh, physical therapist. Um, and I think in, um, I think with professionals, we have our own language. And I think that that language is sort of, um, what do you feel about, do you think that language sort of isolates professionals? Well, I do think that's part of it. And I didn't go deeply into it for this and I explored it more in the Sarah Soli. But I do think that um, one of the reasons professionals find themselves in this situation, there is a lot of jargon that people use. And I do think that there is kind of a disconnect at times with patients. If we're speaking the language of evidence, which is okay with our peers or however, if we're not framing it in a way that uh, patients can really appropriate, then I do think that that can be problematic. Um, so, Yep. And the other question that I had, I don't know what people think about this, but what are the opportunities maybe that are there in a post-professional looking at this idea that we're in a kind of a post-professional era where we acknowledge some of the ways that we may not have fulfilled all of the, um, all of the obligations that were in there and kind of the golden era of thinking about professions uh, in terms of promoting diversity, inclusion and, equ and equity. Any thoughts on that? So we have one response um, that says, I think some of these negative traits are often disregarded or ignored. For example, the recent documentary quotes, picture of scientists, end of quotes, reveals a long history of sexism and racism in the STEM field. The first step is awareness. Yeah, I think that's a great comment. And I do think awareness, you know, the first step is awareness. And um, I also think that um, I don't want this to seem like it's cynic, you know, it's like cynical. I don't mean this in that way. It's an opportunity for us to recognize how we can be what was maybe inherent in those original ideal traits. I don't think people can assume we have to earn it, we have to do it. But I do think that awareness is the first step to recognize that what my, while it might not have been intentional, that there are things that we need to address. So um, one of the things in terms of um, what the humanities might contribute is um, the ideas of intersectionality. And this is something that I think the humanities might contribute. And I don't know that how many of you are teaching about intersectionality, but um, it's way of thinking about identity. You know, I guess it came out of Kimberly Crenshaw's work. 
And um, it talks about how different types of, types of disadvantage interact. And one of the things I liked was to say that there was no, there's no homogenous uh, categories of humans. And I wonder if we're sometimes when we're teaching in humanities, we're trying to give narrative, voice to narrative and those sorts of things. But sometimes our cases are a little bit, um, you know, basic categories for humans. They need, we give more life to different types, different kinds of groups. Any thoughts about that and what the pe way people have used humanities in that way? And I think if people un, uh, do their um, videos, put their video on and speak, they'll be picked up. So, oh, go ahead. So, Sarah Blanton, can you do that? Oh, uh, you mean, uh, oh, I asked the question, sorry, Dolly. Yes. Um, yes, can you ask the question you put in the chat, just to. Oh, yeah. oh sure, sure. It Great. was kind of going Thanks. back a little bit, Dolly, to, I, but, but I think you, you did ask this question about the intersectionality and I, I could, um, I asked a question earlier about um, what you think about the role of, um, in of the study of history and how that might help clinicians understand the socio-political forces that influence a profession's foundation. Um, and I think my second question to you maybe is, what are your thoughts with regards to your most recent, you know, sort of post to the audience about intersectionality, and are you feeling like the fields of critical theory, you know, you know um, disability studies um, offer that type of insight and sort of the way in which we may really navigate some of these questions? Yeah, and this particular article was really good because they talked about how they did use three different pieces of literature. So I think you raised great questions. I do think knowledge of history can be helpful to people to see that. Although we're living in a time when how to teach history is relatively controversial. So you might end up in some political uh, areas, but I do think narratives like they were talking about precious and pretty little dirty things and at any rate, several, several powerful narratives also invite people to look more carefully at history through story. So um, the other thing beneath this question that you're asking is um, you might ask what's the appropriate time for these kinds of things. And before we started the presentation, I know, you know, we were talking about two year hybrid programs and some, you know, there has been a drive towards shorter DPT programs. The question might be, is there time during that for this? So there is, there is some thinking that says, maybe we need to enhance the prerequisites about humanities before to have more before so that people more, are more prepared to engage in some of these discussions. As far as critical race theory, um, uh, I, you know, I think because it's politicized, I, you know, I'm not sure that we would want to be in favor of teaching critical race theory. If I, in some states, but I do think looking at the way different groups have been disadvantaged is an important thing to do. Um, I think in, in a, sorry, in this sort of in a broader concept of critical theory, whether it's um, you know feminism and disability studies <clears throat> or critical race theory, but it, that you know that's a different way of of approaching and, and thinking and analyzing that I feel like we sort of. Uh, are missing out in, in how we um, really try to engage some of those skills and teach those skills with our with our students. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, I, I, I agree with you that that's some critical theory is important for people to be exposed to in terms of how to view, you know, viewing society. And the other thing I know that a lot of people have struggled during the pandemic with how to engage political political dialogue. And I think our students overall, we don't have them real prepared for how to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not in a shooting, a shouting match. I almost said shooting, that would be bad. Must be, I don't know. Bad. But um, it, I think, you know, in preparing people for different ideas, they need to be exposed to the whole continuum. So good ideas. 
So um, the first part was just to frame professions to say that our old ideas about, you know, our former ideas may be revisiting in terms of the way, um, I didn't mention as much the, that the conduct of professionals has also exposed the idea of being a profession because of uh, the many ways that we've, uh, that profession, professionals may have behaved. So, and one reason to talk about the, about the what is a profession is to talk about what professionalism is. So um, one of the things that I found in preparing for this polysericity was that there's not a lot of consensus about what it means to be, what professionalism is. Likewise about what a profession is as well. But um, obviously professionalism is a derivative term that comes from profession. And I love this idea from Burns that, um, that uh, of course he was stealing, uh, you know, that um, that they were stealing, stealing uh, from a poet when he said this, but separating professionalism from the prof from profession is like separating the dancer from the dance, which seemed to be a very humanities kind of thing. So I think they're kind of correlated concepts. Whoops, going the wrong way. Sorry. Um, and there's been an awful lot in the health in the health professions talking about professionalism to the extent that Coulihan described this as kudzu from every nook and cranny in medical education. And I should say that um, physical therapy kind of followed suit as, as medicine was looking and pharmacy and a lot of the other professions, nursing were looking at what it means to be a professional. Likewise, physical therapists were looking at this. So I started trying to track down um, to see if anybody had reached some consensus about what, it, what professionalism means. And what I found was that there was a group, the International Ottawa Conference Group uh, was a working, a working group on trying to define some of these things. And they met uh, together face-to-face -face in 2011, and then they had another meeting uh, subsequent to that to follow up in 2019. And they concluded that there's no real consensus to define professionalism, but they agreed that it was a multi-dimensional construct it was contingent, contextual, dynamic, not abstract, not static, that should vary by profession. One of the things they did come up with that there were different discourse levels. So this had to do with uh, the fact that when we talk about professionalism, you could be talking about uh, whether the qualities of the person, you could be talking about relationships, or you could also be talking about issues at the organizational or societal levels. Now, one of their main goals, the International Ottawa Conference, was to um, look at professionalism evaluation. And they did talk about having different epistemologies. At the second uh, Ottawa Conference in 2019, they recognized that there'd been a shift in, the, uh, shift in the literature where more people were talking about professional identity formation, more so than perhaps looking at professional behaviors. And they had found that there was more attention to learning environments and contexts. Uh, in, in terms of what they saw also, it kind of revealed one of the historic one of the historic dichotomies that ex has existed in looking at professionalism. And by and large, professionalism evaluations have tended to look at either behaviors or look at attitudes and values. And to some extent, this, rep this kind of becomes this divide that's difficult to, to cross because behaviors may not always ref reflect attitudes and values because our you know, our assumption is when a student has uh, poor professional behavior, that this, that this is reflective of some inner attitude or value. And also a lot of the professional behavioral instruments don't always include action, target, timing, um, and those sorts of things that we think are important and context. So, and I, I know there are um, clinical edu DCEs in the group tonight, and how many times when you've, uh, are told about a student's misbehavior or bad professional behavior, do you find out that there were contextual issues that were exacerbating? One of the things that I thought was interesting, they ended up, Wallace did a meta-analysis of 797 studies, and he only found a correlation of 0.41 of attitudes to behavior. And one of the interesting thing I found was that it drops with social pressure and perceived uh, contextual factors. 
The other thing we should be aware of is uh, more and more in professional programs, students that are faking and they know what how to behave, they may not really have those attitudes and behaviors. Uh, I was interested in this too, because a lot of times I used to find this in my ethics class a lot, is that we could do a particular case and everybody would agree that in this case you should do X, Y, or Z. And uh, that was the ethical thing to do. But I found that, uh, that in, if they were confronted with the same situation in clinic, they wouldn't always recognize it because they were seeing it in a different context. So the two things I wanna bring forward here is that professionalism is multi-dimensional and therefore uh, it's problematic from an evaluation standpoint. And second, the con we had don't always capture all the contextual uh, issues there. And finally, this, this issue of behaviors versus attitudes, we really have to look at both. The other thing that came out in this, the work of the Ottawa group, but also just in the work of medicine was that um, to some extent, ethics, uh, originally there were medical ethics that was emphasized in medical curricula, but they were pointing out by the first decade of the 21st century, the prevailing discourse ended up tilting toward professionalism and away from ethics. Now, this was an interesting point. And Hafferty and Tilbert suggested that maybe it took people away from some of the difficult. It's easier to talk about professionalism than it is to talk about the variety of conflicts of interest that are confounding to some of the ethical behavior of professionals. So we decided we started talking about professionalism and to some extent moved away from ethics. <clears throat> I think that there is a hazard in, um, and this is when Winia et al. talking about this professionalism versus ethics. Is this a kind of a fatal flaw that we're encountering in this post-professional period where we're all pursuing per, uh, professionalism, which we don't really have a good definition for, and we're not looking at ethics uh, and we're looking at these as separate entities. Can you really extract ethics from professionalism? And let, you know, you might also think about this as the moral agency part of this. And also, should we be showing professionalism or ethics as uh, distinct from practitioners' responsibilities uh, in terms of their own competency uh, competency and clinical expertise. So this kind of brings us to looking at a kind of a concept where we'll bring all this together. And um, uh, Wynia and uh, et al. kind of talked about this and I drew an illustration of it to show how professional identity is really one of the more important things that transcends between these various domains of the clinical, ethics and values and the interpersonal realms and <clears throat> going across society, organization, teams, and patients. But if we carve out a separate area of professionalism, which we aren't defining well, it's hard for us to see how those things relate. So building on that, um, some have suggested this Wynia at all suggested that professionalism is really an idea, an ethical belief system about how best to organize and deliver health care. And it calls on group members to jointly declare, that is, profess shared, pro shared competency standards and ethical values and to live up to these promises. So if you go back to where we've been in terms of professions, we can see that this, this progression, it really was unkept promises that brought us to the point of the post-professional era. And um, this kind of looking exclusively at behave, a list of behaviors or traits or principle. And I love this quote, this idea from them, it's akin to reducing cooking to a grocery list. So if we have all of these components, it, um, it is professionalism or is it, it, is a, 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 it is ethics, it doesn't work. So um, I don't know if people have questions or comments about that. The idea of, a, of this is that professionalism to some extent has usurped or bumped out some of the ethical concerns which are precisely the way that we need to be looking. And since this is the group, CHEP, that has uh, humanities and ethics, 
this is something we need to think about. I mean, it, it, does this ring true to people that we've been so concerned about professional behaviors? We haven't really necessarily looked at the belief system that needs to undergird it. Questions? I know that's a lot of information. I'm. No, there's several. Um, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to back up just a smidgen. Sorry. Because there was and an, people feel free to come on and pose their question yeah, oh, too. Yeah, absolutely. And that would probably be helpful. I just want to back up for a second. Oh, oh, here it is. So we had a question from Amy Klein, and this was before this was on the last question break. And I do yeah. want to address it because I think um it's becoming more and more important or more and more. Okay, Amy Klein, she yes. asks hard questions sometimes. She does. She said, <laughs> are, she's asking, are you suggesting that residency or fellowship programs have a role and or responsibility to address these concepts? And that was in the last question break. And, and we, I just ran out of time before I could connect. Yeah, and Amy can feel free to come on too. And I'm ask on. I figured I'd let you answer first. <laughs> okay, so I think absolutely the meaning of this is we have to look all the way across. The idea that somehow professionalism as an ethical belief system, as an unkept promise, and learning how to keep the promise with that centers clinical expertise and um, with the other dimensions of professionalism that we were outlining there, clinical, ethical, and interpersonal, absolutely that needs to continue, it has to continue through residency. And thank you for your question, because I think it also has to continue into practice. I posed the question for people, are there places where clinicians can ask questions about ethics that occur to them. Are there, there are a few places that have grand ethics ground, grounds. I know that Mass General has them. I know some other places may, but in a lot of, I get a lot of questions from clinicians. I'm sh clinicians. I don't know what a clinicianer is, but a clinician. And um, Nan, I know probably other people that have been associated with ethics get questions about how should I handle the situation? Do you have a follow-up, Dr. Klein? You know, I just think that since if you look at the core competencies for residency education um, and fellowship changes a little bit as you go to that more specialized within um, the role of, of clinical specialties, I think it's, it's important professionalism ethics is not identified specifically in residencies, but professionalism is. And I do think that um, we're taking in many cases new grads who are looking for specialization to grow their practice without growing necessarily or intuitively their professional identity. And I think we have a role as residency and fellowship programs to not just look at their clinical skills and their clinical reasoning, but certainly to be able to look at their ability to enhance their professional identity. I think that's a great point. And if you look at residency in terms of this interlocking competencies and promises, I, I've thought for a long time, although I, you know, I'm not sure where to take this thought, but shouldn't, shouldn't, and I don't know if they do or they don't, but clinical specialization, if I'm a clinical specialist in a certain area, shouldn't I be, fam be familiar with the most common ethical and professional issues that come to my, in, in that pair practice. And shouldn't there be questions that talk about what is considered uh, optimal and ideal practice in that regard? And I don't know someone, I don't know that there are those types of questions on any of the specialization or in the educational programs that lead to that. But the idea that somehow, uh, you know, learning about professionalism and ethics ends as soon as you get that DPT. And I know there are a couple of states that require ongoing ethics education, but not many, I don't think. So great question. Um, the other thing, are there other questions, Cindy, for, at this point? Oh, oh, oh yeah. 
I'm sorry. Okay. I feel like I'm interrupting you and I don't mean to, but. Um, no, maybe, no, that's, okay. that's good. Maybe Nicole Christensen would like to share her thoughts from the chat. Hi, Nicole. Okay, I, I will share what she said. I think the approach to ethics that links to narrative inquiry and narrative reasoning is directly linked to foundational concepts from the humanities. And I appreciate your comment, Nicole. Yes, I agree with that. Um, and uh, I do agree with that. I do think that the, um, I say this with trepidation because I know that Nicole is an expert in narrative and comes from in, but I think there that we should, we may need to broaden because a lot of people think humanities is only narrative and narrative reflection. But I embrace totally the idea that we need a better understanding um, of narrative as part of the humanities. Um, and and as part of professional practice and expertise. And I have, um, I am so sorry if I do not pronounce your name correctly. Um, Radnea, you seem to be getting some comments in the chat and I would love if you could um, speak directly to Dr. Swisher. So you can unmute. And oh, I, I was just saying um, earlier on when you were mentioning the cases and, and the angle to which we write the cases and, and perhaps the lack of diversity that are in the cases in our curriculum. And, and I think it, it does primarily come from the fact that there's a lack of diversity within the profession and the faculty creating the cases are going to create the cases in a lens of which like they are living in, which tends to be within that of the dominant culture. And that sometimes in attempts to create cases that are reflect intersectionality and diversity, we end up, um, cases end up perhaps um, enhancing stereotypes or feeding into stereotypes. And, and while it might be impossible to not, you know, dissect out all of that, but just really being open to having conversations with students about what are your, what are your thoughts surrounding this case? Why? you know, why did you have that thought and being able to have conversations about sort of initial reactions and diving into, into those types of things, I think is really important to be able to do. I, uh, to I agree with that entirely. And I have my own disaster experiences of trying to promote diversity and realizing that what the students got out of it was stereotype because after all, I am a white person. And I had, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, that it just, it's hard to do. And it speaks to how we have to be something different. And that's why I think professional identity as formation is so important, both collectively and individually. And I also, I don't have as much time as I'd like to, to bring it out, but I think the idea of partnership, and I'm going to give a shout out to Charlene Corte, and then talking about how she talked about allyship. That's why I think we may need to partner or ally ourselves with uh, patients, for one thing, to understand what they think professionalism is. Uh, one of the things that came out of the Ottawa group was the need to partner with patients to understand what expectations are. But I also think that they would help us to understand how we could translate those concerns for students within cases. And I, and I was Dr. Cooperstein, so great to see you. Yeah, really, and also like the goal of creating a culture within the classroom of humility in that I am going to make right. a mistake, perhaps at some point, like it, it, yes. it, you know, and, and that we are all in this together and holding one another accountable um, to have these conversations and for people to feel comfortable in speaking up can really go a, can really go a long way is what I found. Yes, absolutely. And you brought out another uh, important point. Um, I think, which is, well, you're just saying the willingness, the willingness to say that you've made mistakes and to be open. I think that's, that's great. It does go a long way. So I want to add briefly to that, that we, we all do make mistakes. And one of the ways I am learning 
to catch when you're perhaps making a mistake is if you start a description of a case with the intersectionality or the various um, uh, descriptors of a patient that may or may not have anything to do with the case. So I think that's an example that I, I believe someone mentioned earlier about forcing the process and reinforcing stereotypes rather than letting a case unfold and letting the intersectionality of the patient unfold during perhaps the subjective information or perhaps when you're talking about a living environment, uh, rather than saying a such and so this age female it presents with. So I think when we don't lead with that, it's better right. to let it unfold in the case. And, and that's clinical language. And I think that's really important that article by Barry et al. Um, where they talked about uh, the story precious and those sorts of things. If you lead with these three, you know, these, this is a so-and-so, which is a so-and-so, which is a so-and-so. It's an entirely different process than if you tell the story and talk about the person's experience. And then post facto, you come back and ask, what role did the fact that the person was African-American play? Uh, what role did the role poverty, how did they interact? Post facto, it's a different thing, which kind of comes back to um, uh, Nicole's question, point about narrative, the narrative lens versus being in the clinical factual kind of realm. Exactly. So um, the other thing, um, Renaya, was it, or is it, is that how you say your name, Rania? It's Rania. It's like Tanya with an R. Rania. I'm so sorry, but Rania. So one of the things I wanted to say was, I don't think that physical therapists always embrace conflict. And I've seen in my students and often in the faculty, an unwillingness to look at conflictual questions. And I'm not sure that we're going to be able to kind of get through looking at some of the issues that we need to in terms of diversity and um, inclusion and equity without being better at addressing conflict in a humane and um, non-polarizing way. So I don't know what people's thoughts about that are, but we've probably paused long enough. So um, thank you for those, oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, we can come back to it, but we had a couple more thoughts. About. Oh, that's fine. We're here for okay. you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, Amanda, do you mind um, unmuting and turn on your camera? And because you've had a good number of responses too. Sure. Hello. So, um, you know, I I think that we just have to be, and I I don't have a solution to this. I don't have a magic answer or a, or a way to do it, but I. I think whether it's how we talk about a case or how we address, um, we, we integrate humanities into our curricula. I think so often um, humanities or professional behaviors are seen as you know sort of these token things. And, and what I wonder how we can um, make topics, critical race theory, disability studies, you know, the integration of, of intersectionality not be this token thing that we add to our curriculum like a checklist. Because I think so often it's like, oh, we need, we have to address this. And it was interesting, you know, you put that, that in the slide about the recipe and it's checking something off. I mean, it's sort of, uh, there's got, we have to, if we're gonna talk about humanities and professional development and, and really expand on all these areas, we have to thread it through from beginning to end. Um, so I, I, I don't know how to not make these things sort of the token. Yep, we talked about disability theory. We talked about that. Um, and, and I think we've got a big challenge ahead to do it, to do it the right way and to get all faculty on board, because ultimately I think that's what we would need to do. Well, I think you're on to something. The faculty as a whole have to commit to it and the profession as a whole has to commit to it. And I think we're kind of in that process. But I know that many of the people on this phone call, if you teach humanities, professionalism and ethics, you're kind of marginalized because it's like you're taking care of this part and we may see ourselves as more central, but others may not. So I think you raise a good point. 
So I'm going to go on because I know that we're only we only got 10 minutes and I'm only not so far along on it. Oh, and Lisa's raised her hand. Hi there. There are other um, people. There we go. Um, I'll lower my hand. I, I just wanted to kind of echo what you've said about what, what I, I, I am a DCE, full disclosure, and um, something I want to say about like what, what I call the soft skills, which are the things mm -hmm. that they're learning in their clinical education courses, potentially outside with their CIs, but their academic team is holding them accountable for those things and, gui and trying to guide them in a way um, and it's, and there isn't a right answer, but I think there are, there are core standards that we could all agree on about humanity and personhood, but whether those things are inherent in our teaching, I think is something to, to continue to, to review and look at. Yeah, I agree. And right now the accreditation standards aren't so high about humanities, just that you have to have some background in them. So um, I'm going to turn just a little bit and great comments, great questions. Hopefully we can get, and I'll stay on at the end for people that want to discuss uh, later. But I wanted to talk about where we've been and when we look at professionalism, PT education, and I identified several periods. I note that you could have different periods, but this is which is how I saw it. And I will say that I had an extremely complicated chart at one time that showed authors under this. So if you have an interest in an overly complex slide, I can help you with that. But in, uh, in 1979, uh, uh, professionalism was really ethics, very much like medicine. And in 1987, they were, were more turned toward looking at behaviors. And part of what was behind that, Carol Davis wrote a really brilliant article about affective behaviors and noting that we had to look at uh, evaluating professionalism differently than perhaps some of the other skills. And she talked a lot about the importance of understanding context, which we haven't totally necessarily uh, embraced, but that was kind of a good piece. And then we had the... Um, Core value, we, have, we, we had the generic abilities, which have been uh, huge in physical therapy, the, which became perhaps professional behaviors. The core values came along in 2003. This was kind of uh, coming out of medicine where they had done core values and then sample behaviors that went with that. And starting at about 2005, we had a lot more looking at professional identity, but also looking at moral reasoning and moral agency and, all, and some of those things that looked more at the person than at the behavior. And finally, we've had a lot more look, uh, examination of professionalism as a program outcome. And how do we know we're doing a good job? Along the way, we've had a lot of, we've had some literature, but not a great deal looking at curriculum and specific strategies for looking at this. So one of the things that you'll note when you're looking at the quote, so-called generic abilities that now we think of more of as professional behaviors is you kind of have a, a part and a subpart thing. Is professionalism the bigger tent or is it the smaller, uh, uh, the smaller tent? Because to some extent, the generic abilities are professionalism abilities. And yet you still have professionalism as a part of that. You could argue that communication management and interpersonal skills are part of professionalism. And yet it's seen as a separate thing, which shows you part of the problem that we talked about before of it being a multi-dimensional uh, approach. The core values of professionalism, we also see uh, were a key part of Vision 2020 when the association committed to enhancing the professionalism of physical therapy. And it was modeled after similar work in medicine. And it was an attempt to look at professionalism and identified this now we, uh, there have been subsequently changes to that. So you see, we have these eight areas. Just in terms of teaching, one of the challenges of this, there is a self-assessment, but in my experience, a lot of times the self-assessment might work better for people who are in the clinic, not necessarily for students who may not have had some of the chance to do some of those things. So um, if you look at what's going on here, like, like medicine, like all other health professions, we've, we've really focused more on behaviors than others. And we're kind of in the period of moving towards professional identity formation. So you might say when we look at the collective and the individual look at professionalism in PT, we still have no consensus on the definition, although you could argue that the core values give some of that. We're early in reframing things 
things and embracing the idea that we maybe haven't been as inclusive and those sorts of things as we as we need to be and maybe the things that we haven't succeeded in in terms of ideal professionalism. We focus more on behaviors and we've looked more at a quantitative epistemology. There are limited numbers, types, and types of valid, reliable evaluation instruments with construct validity to look at professionalism. Our curriculum is variable. There's a limited amount of research about professionalism cur curriculum, but it's definitely variable. If you've been on CAPTI site visits, you can have, you, you, there's, there's you know, tremendous variation in those. I would also say we have limited faculty with expertise in professionalism from a scholarly standpoint. And we do have the problem of kind of dividing ethics and professionalism from each other. So looking at that history of where we've come in education, which is decidedly abbreviated, by the way, and I apologize for how quickly we went through that. I think we have we can ask ourselves, what's the how can we evaluate outcomes of the humanities and professionalism content? as well as the ethics content. Thoughts about this? And I know there's some leftover questions, so. Hello? I was just waiting to see if someone would say anything. Oh, okay. No, sorry. My um, internet server um, cuts out sometimes, so I thought I might be stalled. No, 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 no. You're you're great. Thank you so much. I, um, does anybody have any thoughts? I, I know there was some discussion going back to earlier in your lecture about soft skills being reframed as essential skills. Does anyone want to? Talk about that because there's quite a few comments. Well, hi, we can say that for the oh, end. Oh, who someone was speaking? Go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Jenny Rodriguez. I put that uh, comment in the chat. And I say we, but it's not necessarily our entire faculty, but we've recognized the importance of messaging within ourselves and also to our students. So, um, and we've just started kind of this message of these skills are essential skills and soft skills imply not as important as other right. skills the students are learning in, in their education. Thank you. Yeah, and the other thing, I didn't have time to elaborate. I encourage people to look at the um, Ottawa group because one of the things they talked about in terms of looking at program outcomes and looking at program contributions is um, the problem of implicit, implicit versus explicit curriculum, organizational culture, and those kinds of messages that kind of if the faculty's not all committed to thinking of professionalism, humanities and ethics content as important, you'll have a tremendous problem with getting students to do that. And also if you're embracing that and the faculty aren't modeling it, or they're getting contrary messages on their clinical education, then this becomes problematic, um, you know, and you have an authenticity problem. So likewise, I think that um, in terms of evidence, there is an evidence that goes with ethics, humanities, and professionalism. We do know things about that. So I don't think you know this whole soft thing becomes problematic in that way. So Dolly, we had one more important, or what I think is an important point, and I um, have my fingers crossed that Corey, who provided something in the chat, is pretty meaningful and my eyes and I hope he or she, it could be a she. Okay, Corey. Here. Yes, that is me. Uh, hi. So one of the, th I think uh, the comment being referred to is that often we allow perfect to be the enemy of good. And so many faculty members are afraid to integrate this into their curriculum and what they teach in their courses because they're afraid they're going to say it wrong or feed into a stereotype or have an implicit bias that comes out. And in that avoidance, that fearful avoidance, we end up not making any forward progress. And so if we come in with open hearts and lift the curtain a little bit, let the students see that we are flawed, we try, and you know we may not get it right. And we 
aren't just the sage on the stage, that I think that that opens up the opportunity for our teaching to be more impactful and to have collegial conversations with our students as we develop together. I, I agree with that entirely. And I will say that one of the most successful approaches to ethics and professionalism education was in dentistry, it was Muriel, she goes by and went by Mickey Bebo, and they set up a whole uh, process for the dentists in University of Minnesota for getting feedback about their moral reasoning and professionalism and those sorts of things. And uh, one time we asked her how she got the faculty to buy into this. And she had had, she had the faculty read students' discussion of ethics and professionalism cases. And after that, she said they recognized the need for this uh, approach. So um, I know we're at in nearing the end of our time. And um, one of the things uh, is to think about new directions. And uh, I love this. Hafferty and Castellani have written a lot in medicine about professionalism and musing. He's maybe not in his most, in, um, his most positive mode about what his own accomplishments were. Traditional conceptions of what it means to be a professional as a standalone entity are neither systematic, realistic, nor ultimately sustainable. Like it or not, we re remain awash in a sea of complexity. And I think this does capture kind of where we are. Um, it's very, especially now in COVID, it's a very difficult and uncertain time in being a professional. I think we have to prepare people for that kind of uncertainty. So I think some new directions in professionalism is we have to understand that uh, professionalism has to be grounded in ethics and it has to be a commitment from the profession as a whole. We do need more partnerships with uh, different, with patients, clinical faculty, and stakeholders. Somehow we have to have our a curricula, our curricula have to foster professional identity, supportive learning. You can see the things that I have talked about there, but we also have to expand our horizons and think about what other, what disciplines and content might be um, appropriate. And uh, ultimately, there do need, I don't want people to think I'm saying that professional behaviors are not important. I think perhaps, perhaps professional behaviors are important, and we do need some way to look at outcomes at the program level and also at the individual level. One of the directions we might take is this professional identity formation, and it basically says competencies really aren't enough. We have to be looking at identity and competency in tandem and uh, that these are complementary aspects. And I think that applies both individually and collective. It's a developmental focus. If we look at the difference between being and doing, we understand that there are different ways of approaching this education. And this looks at different ways that you'd um, evaluate these things. So for example, identity might rely more on narrative, might rely <clears throat> more on looking at the self across different milestones and giving frequent formative feedback. Um, <clears throat> Reflective writing and narrative errors behaviors may have more um, set clear behavioral expectations and those sorts of things. I think that um, humanities can, tr can contribute to both aspects of this. Um, the way this works, there's a, uh, Calais et al has a great illustration. Really, Bebo was the one that kind of developed some of this, but you can set bench, benchmarks at where people should be. And this relates a little bit to Amy Klein's question, because there are, you, you would expect a resident to be more in the self-transforming phase. So they look at how you, where you're expected to be at different stages, different ways to look at that. There are transcendental, transitional phases, but uh, basically you're progressing more from an external reliance at stage two, how to get things done, people telling you, and more to an independent, -ish, uh, uh, independent professional identity that um, is self-transforming. I also, because we're talking about this, and a shout out again just to the Journal of Humanities and Rehabilitation, um, I just want to say that our new understandings of professional arose from a broad range of science. We have to evaluate what are the what are the knowledge bases and disciplines that support physical therapist practice. Humanities have long been part of mass medicine and nursing and a variety of other fields. So we might want to think about that. You can look at ways that the humanities might contribute. 
um, philosophy. We seldom think about philosophy. And I know we had a question earlier about the importance of language. And I re it did cause me to remember, I used to say this in class, and now I don't because people think I might be um, crazy or something, as Heidegger used to say that language is the house of being. And I think we have to take seriously that language shapes all that we do. Philosophy is a way to look at that. And Gibson has talked a lot about critical theory and those sorts of things. Likewise, we have to bring those kinds of tools, sociological and philosophical, to look at movement. And we sometimes don't really reflect as much about uh, embodiment and power. Art, narrative, and literature all have something to uh, offer to that. And um, I think that this is one place that uh, Chep can uh, contribute to that. Um, I know we're probably over time, so uh, I, I'll stay on for whatever people would like to continue the discussion. Oh, one of the things I raise here, by the way, is we there's it's we don't really have a shared uh, definition of humanities, and some people look at humanities in different ways, whether it's psychology and sociology, other social sciences. Does it include philosophy? Does it not include philosophy? So. <clears throat> Uh, other people are talking now about the caring sciences, so there are different ways we could look at it. I will say I, um, I think not everybody understands when you say humanities that it's not just literature. And of course, that's been one of the main traditions in medicine is to look more at the visual arts and um, literature. But you can look at humanities more broadly. Is ethics a subpiece of that? And philosophy a subpiece of that? Or are they kind of in a separate category? So I think we have to look at what are the disciplines that we think might contribute more to physical therapy practice. Are there more questions or comments? There are a few, um, especially you seem to have started a conversation about faculty that may, may or may not embrace. And then we had a comment for Nathan about speaking of professional expectations within faculty I notice there are very few men on this webinar. Are they not interested? Um, do they de-emphasize this topic compared to others? Whatever the answer, I think it's a problem. And, and he said a couple of responses. OK, that's a good insight, is uh, I do think probably the humanities, I don't know what the membership in humanities is. I think it probably is more female than male. But I wouldn't presume to talk about why that that is the case. I agree. As a as a female, I'm a I'm a little reluctant to add any insight here. Um, I, I will leave that to Nathan. Just just an observation. <laughs> yeah. I also would no, be I think wary. <clears throat> I also would be yeah. wary of of. Uh, of uh, hypothesizing, which is something I, I thought about. Right. And and at all the, I've been really involved with CHEP since the beginning, and I've noticed that CSM, ELC, uh, the vast majority of, of participants at, at uh, discussions like this uh, tend to be female. So it was just something mm -hmm. that I thought, I really wonder why, you know, why, why aren't more men right. or faculty members involved, you know? It's so important. Well, I, and I do think that somehow we have to demonstrate the value. We see the inherent value and we, we do, it's every, most people in this session would think that this is valuable material, but the problem of proving outcomes is difficult. I know Rita Sharon wrote a really great article about uh, how do you demonstrate the value of non-quantitative means of approaching things when, when, uh, using, you know, how do you de how do you demonstrate that when the presumption is it has to be quantitative measures for it? So, you know, it's been hard for humanities to show their outcomes uh, partially because of how we're approaching it. And again, in the Ottawa studies that they did, which was, by the way, interprofessional, not just medicine, they did find that most people are approaching it more quantitatively. And that's definitely, um, you know, how do you prove? And I know there are people that are looking at empathy. There are people looking that uh, there are other quantitative measures, but it is difficult to show the outcomes for it. So 
so Dolly, there is a request for the Ottawa reference. Um, is is that a possibility? It's a Cindy. I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I don't know if the Sarasoli. I can post the. This is a very abbreviated version of what the Sarasoli was because the idea was to discuss. I can post the handout from that, and then I can post this as well. So, and I think I had it. Uh, oh, it's in the references at the end. I'm sorry. I can post this. Great. Or um, if you if you're on the call still and you've asked for a reference, and several of you have said, just email me tomorrow, and I will get what you need. And that still holds case. So I think someone wanted the reference about the dentist who define professionalism as well. Yeah, I can give some references. She's published a lot, so I can give. I don't know if I have one for that because that was a conversation, but I sure. can give references. For that. So if, at any rate, this is Cindy Dodds. I've already posted my email. If any of you that are still here need something, if you're send me an email, I will try to take care of it in the next few days. It may not be immediate, but I will get to you as quick as I can. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I think this is kind of whimsical to Hafferty. I talked about him already, but he said perhaps professionalism is more of a journey than a destination, depending on the willingness of the community to engage with itself in an ongoing and reflective search for a soul defined by the core values of selflessness and service. And um, I think there's some truth to that. And um, quoting one of the old sociology um, experts who was Friedson, who was kind of in the middle stage there, he said the most important problem for any profession isn't structural, economic, cultural, or ideological, but it's, it's the battle for its soul. And I think that's true. Um, I think we live in kind of uncertain times, and I think we have to um, try to prepare professionals for that. And I think humanities and uh, ethics and professionalism um, content have a lot to bring to that. I'll stay on for anybody that has additional questions or wants to discuss. I know we've gone a little bit over time and we'll post this, but I'd be happy to talk with anybody that wants to continue the dialogue. Hey, Dolly. Hi, Wendy. How are you? Good. Thank Thanks you for, your for tuning time. in. I, I posted a thing in the chat, but I was kind of curious, you know, when you're talking about how we can better thread professionalism and ethics in the curriculum, has there been any studies or anything done where they've, we've looked at how people are mapping within the curriculum? Does it come out to it ends up being more standalone courses or people having intently purposely put content in every single course in their curriculum? So there are very few studies about this, but I know there was a study in nursing and I'm trying to remember exactly what it said, but I think it, uh, it, it depends if you have one course or if you have several courses. So there are a million ways to do it. And some people have, they have a professional or professionalism or PI or whatever they're gonna call it. And they map that through and they follow it other, all the way through. There are other curricula and physical therapy that only have, that have one course basically. <clears throat> and then of course there are more problem-based kind of curricula where they always deal with certain things and ethics is one of them. But one of the things that people said uh, that resonates with me is if you go in the route that you've got it in every course, which is difficult, a lot of many faculty don't feel prepared to deal with that content. So you have to figure out how to deal with getting people ready for that. And um, it was also kind of not so many people that have expertise and like the, some of the psychological and sociological or the ethics. A lot of people are very uncomfortable being an ethics preceptor. So first of all, I don't, there aren't very many studies in PT about this. I know there was one um, done in nursing where they looked at threaded through versus one standalone course first. And I'm, I'd have to look and see how that turned out. But a solitary limited course is not likely to make a, a big impact if there's nothing else going on. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
Thanks for your talk. Thank you. Very Good thought to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I know we're down to, looks like 26 people. Lisa Hayes again. I'm hi Lisa. Good. Hi. I put a comment in the chat, but I thought I'd throw it out there um, as a discussion as well. Um, just that that last comment you you read, the, the last quote about like community and and have it being emotional, it reminded me of a struggle I had personally as a clinician um, about moral injury and burnout. And, and it made me feel like, gosh, if professionalism was more defined, would that moral injury have occurred? And, and is our profession at risk of more moral injury and burnout because our professionalism is unclear? Just, it, it was- Wow, well, there's a lot in that. So um, I do think, and I know Nancy Kirsch has, um, had some thoughts about moral injury and there is a lot of discussion of this. I do think that we have to prepare people for these situations, um, moral injury, moral dis distress, burnout and the aspects of ethics and professionalism are in that because we do know that people that take on some of the um, ethics battles or professionalism battles that can be, um, that can leave moral, what they call moral residue or moral injury. So I do think we have to pre prepare people for that. And I also think that as a profession and <clears throat> as educators, we have to provide resources for people about how to deal with that. But I wouldn't want to imply that it's because we're somehow not adequate. You know, our profession has failed exactly. I just think that we're still in a developmental stage. And also we're you know, with COVID, I think we're facing unprecedented challenges out there. But what I, uh, I also believe we haven't attended to the organizational aspects and preparing people for how we should deal with certain organizational practices that we may find are um, not congruent with our code of ethics and those sorts of things. And it's real easy to tell people, well, you should just find a different job. Or, and I think that's how a lot of people deal with it, but not before they may have suffered uh, quite a bit of moral injury or those sorts of moral distress before they go. Yeah, and definitely more kind of just questioning how that all connects together and, and whether we're just, just, I just, yeah, it was, it was an initial thought. I don't, I don't have it fully. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fully thought out did but it just I, kind of did triggered. I speak to it or not I think so definitely and I, I would agree with you that that we're not quote unquote failing as a profession but we're growing and clarifying but I think mm -hmm. I think for me for me maybe that that the fact that we're still growing and clarifying makes makes professionalism more challenging to both assess as a as a professor and to teach as well. Right. Well, the other part of that is I think that, you know, the organizational aspects are probably, you know, if you look at kind of, you know, and I know Dr. Kirsch has published quite a bit about the realms. And I think that we that in our teaching, we attend the least to these um, organizational and societal. And probably one of the most common issues that physical therapists may present is where they think there's some kind of element of the organizational structure that is creating a, you know, either hampering their ability to care for patients or is not in line with other aspects of the code, code of ethics. And it's very difficult for you to know what for physical therapists always to do something in that because they may not be able to move the organization. And likewise, physical therapists aren't necessarily always the decision makers. So I think that that's something we've got to look at more. What about organizational practices and recommendations for physical therapists that find themselves in situations that aren't great like that? So Dolly, this is Cindy. And in thinking about that, I would um, wonder what your thoughts are about experiences from a global health perspective and moving outside of the United States that help us 
as individuals find our place with negotiating those more, I would say, ethical decisions in this country. Um, well, I think that's a good idea. It sounds like you may know more about that than I do, but I do think that oftentimes looking at how things work in other countries and just like as in cultures, it's that whole sociological thing of the outsider perspective you're more able to see maybe what are the things that are, so to speak, baked into our own system as problems that other people may not have in the same way, you know, and that comparative, is that what you're saying? I think so. I think we're, um, this is just my opinion, but I think the United States is a very impairment. If you go back to the ICF model, it was a very impairment driven model. Let me fix this and everything's going to be okay. And as physical, right. Therapist, right, as physical therapist, what I think um, hearing is, you know, yeah, you can fix that brain injury and they are alive, but if they're missing actual brain tissue, that's not going to be restored. What impact does that have on the family, this and society and various other levels, whereas in other countries, it's viewed and, and y'all can throw rotten tomatoes at me, but in other countries that don't have the ability to fix significant impairments, it, be, it becomes more about life. And, and I don't mean to sound like I'm not grateful for our medical science. I just think sometimes it places therapists in a weird conundrum in this country because, because we can do it, but then we're left to try and fix it. And, and most of us probably realize we can't fix it. And in other countries, right. there, is, there is no fix. So it becomes about celebrating life. Right. And, and not uh, I agree with you. Somehow, how, how are we looking at, how are we going to put ourselves in the context of life overall. I think that's important to do. And I do think, you know, we probably are unaware of how reimbursement driven we really are, you know, in that way. And likewise, who are the people we're not seeing, who literally never can get through the system to see us. So. Yep, that's a very good point as well, because we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> Right. And I know a lot of schools have uh, pro bono clinics, and that's good. I think people do see some of the people who aren't able to get through, but not everyone. Other thoughts or I'm not meaning to hang people up, but I'm perfectly willing to talk more with and more questions. So I have a comment about professionalism. So I'm in education. We do a lot of interdisciplinary work. We have a physical therapy program, occupational therapy program. And each of our didactic courses have a professionalism component. And I agree with you, it's not well defined. But, you know, in terms of how they interact with other students, um, their behaviors primarily. Um, and, you know, ethics is very situational, obviously. I mean, you can't, you know, what's ethical today may not be ethical tomorrow. And, but I think that you have to have a continuous system where a professionalism is part of the evaluation and ethics is you know very important as well but uh, ethics is very like i said situational what's ethical in war may not be ethical in peacetime um and you know in terms of the whole issue of uh racism and sexism i think there's a lot of denial and that's part of the problem um and people do not like to be confrontational. Um, and, you know, we have a history in this country of systemic structural racism. Um, and 
I think part of it is just being open that that was the case and and looking at realistically. Um, so anyhow, I think so, professionalism is very important and you have to continuously assess it, continuously address it. And if you have situations, my, me personally, if I, if I have a situation with a student where it's a professional or an ethical issue, I frame it as a learning experience. And sometimes you cannot change a person's value. So, you know, that's, that's right. another issue. Well, we didn't get to explore that very much, but the literature kind of suggests we should talk about um, professionalism lapses versus not being, you know, you're non, you were not professional because uh, that's sometimes people perceive that as injurious. But I agree with you about interprofessional ethics. We need to look at that more. And there, um, I think that there are the thing about professionalism. There are common elements, but there's also we do have a specific contract. Each of our disciplines, we have individual uh, situations there and also scope of practice issues. So it's very challenging. And we I've done quite a bit of interprofessional, some interprofessional ethics, and you kind of have to craft it with that in mind, because the purview uh, of what the medicine, the doctor is, is different than what the PA is and those sorts of things. So the best, the best cases are ones that you've developed interprofessionally. It's hard to can them. And um, you have to get at the common elements. I do think what you were talking about, about systemic racism and some of the cultural aspects are great areas to share in interprofessional uh, courses because they're kind of confronting the same things, even though their obligations may be different. So good comment. Anything Thank else I can... Probably a good place to end it. Um, if we can all say thank you to Dr. Swisher for her time with us today. Um, I know we can't say it, but thank you. <laughs> and <Very> thank you. <laughs> I think there's a few, uh, not as many people on now, so we could probably say thank you. Um, thank you. But yeah, so whoever's on left on the call, just keep an eye out for future webinars from Chet. Um, uh, the next meeting is going to be at ELC, so we will see you there. And thank you for joining, and thank you, Dr. Swisher. Thanks, everyone. Thank I know you. we didn't have as much time as we might have wanted, and I zoomed through some things, but thanks to all of you for attending. You did great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you.